Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it is Friday at the IETF. <laughs> Some of you are probably tired, like me. <laughs> oh, great. Um, Curtis and I are um, really excited you're all here. Um, Curtis is remote. Curtis, you want to say hi? Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And Curtis is on the west coast of the US, so it's early morning for Curtis um, uh, ish. Yeah. Um, this research group is part of the Internet um, Engineering Task Force Research Task Force, the IRTF. I'm going to go through the note well quickly. Many of you have seen this all week, but it's uh, important that we go through it again. Um, it's just a reminder of the IETF policies in effect on a variety of topics, such as patents, codes of conduct, et cetera. Um, it points you in the right direction, and also there's a note here about the patent policy. You'll see there are um, different information here about the VCPs, everything from the standards process, the working group processes, anti-harassment procedures, code of conduct, and other. And this is a note really well. Um, all IETF meetings and mailing lists are intended for professional collaboration and networking as defined in the um, IETF guidelines for conduct, anti-harassment policy, and procedures. If you have any concerns about observed behavior, please talk to the ombuds team who are available if you need confidentiality to raise concerns um, about harassment or other conduct in the IETF. The IETF strives to create and maintain an environment in which people of many different backgrounds and identities are treated with dignity, decency, and respect. IETF participants must not engage in harassment while at IETF meetings, virtual meetings, um, events, and mailing lists. It's not welcome at all, and harassment is um, hostile or intimidating behavior and particular speech or behavior that's aggressive or intimidates, might be repetitive. Anyway, you see that um, about the anti-harassment policy and if you feel that you need to chat with someone, you can also talk to me or um, Colin, who's the head of the IOTF. Meeting tips, obviously the session is being recorded. If you don't want your face <laughs> um, visible, uh, um, please take measures to um, protect yourself there. In-person participants, make sure you sign into the session using um, the MeetEcho uh, client. Also, uh, scan the QR code with your phone. Um, if you would like to join the queue once we've started the um, presentations and the Q&A session, use the MeetEcho client in order to join the queue. There's a new interface, and so it may be not familiar. It's probably familiar for all of you now, now at this point this week. Um, Keep audio and video off if not using the on-site version. Also, please put your phones on mute just so it does. your phones don't ring during the session or there are beeps and throughout the session. Remote participants, please make sure your audio and video are off unless you're chairing or presenting during the session. Use of a headset strongly recommended so we can hear you. Resources um, for IETF 118 Prague, if this is your first day. Uh, agenda, meet echo, and other information here. And we're going to head into the panel. So um, I'll ask Andre to come and Theo. If you both want to come up here, you're welcome to. And we'll just bring up another chair. We have a great panel. And Curtis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah? No, I think Theo and um, Andre are not the panelists. They're the speakers to start. Oh, sorry, speakers. Very right, right. OK, Theo, you can either stand up here or sit up here with me. It's up to you. And Andre will come up in a minute. Sorry about that. Long week. So I'm turning it over to you, uh, Curtis, for some intros, yeah? Uh, sure. Wait a moment for, I guess, Theo's slides to be up. They're not showing up yet. I see a deck being shared. Not by nope. me. No, we've got sometimes um, Meet Echo Data Tracker needs to sync, and I just uploaded the slides a minute ago. So, but I can share my screen. Hang on. Give me two seconds, and we'll pull Theo's presentation up. I just now realized it's Meet Echo and not Echo.
All right, well, while, while this is slow rolling and going, um, our first speaker is uh, Theo Benson. Um, Theo is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and um, a collaborator at Carnegie Mellon University Africa out of uh, Rwanda. Um, and an old friend uh, from way back in some Facebook days, if I remember right, when I first met you. So I'm excited to see what you have to say. What did he? Uh... Curtis, you kind of hopped out there for a sec, a little garbled. Can you repeat what you just said? Oh, I was just doing the intro, but go, go ahead, Theo, go. All right, thanks for the intro. Um, I'm not a big fan of intros to start by saying we go way back because it reminds me that we're all getting really old. Um, so the talk is not uh, a research talk. The talk is more a cry for help. Um, I'm working towards trying to understand connectivity, I'm working towards trying to find ways to improve terrestrial connectivity in Africa. And so much of this talk is to describe how I think of the problem and to ask you guys to help me get data. Okay, next slide. And, uh, this is the advancing slide moment that Jane did learn how to do. Does anyone know how to advance the slides with a new? So I feel like we survived the pandemic <laughs> and now I have calls that require Zoom, Skype, or Teams and Zoom always works. Every time I switch to Skype, Teams, or Hangouts, I've lost like 15 minutes of a meeting. So I feel like we're going to lose hopefully two minutes. Did that work? Yes, yeah, so well, you have to update. And good people, I've been using different platforms for a long time. That's why it's so no, sorry. This is good. Wonderful. Thank you. All righty. And then close that. Oh, God. No, I, I, I only know this because I already ran into the problem this week. Okay. Stop that. Okay. Holy now smokes. it should be there. Voila. Okay, Theo. Whoopsie. Hang on. That's all right. There you go. All right. Holy smokes. Okay. Good job. There you go. All right. So the. If you look at Africa right now, uh, there's a lot that's going on. Yet, when you think about things from a performance perspective, performance is still quite poor. Uh, reliability is also questionable. Um, if you look at uh, trace routes or you look at latency, one thing you'll notice, and this is not a, a new problem, Pierre um, and Roderick at Lyon had looked at this a couple of years ago, and there are some recent people also looking at this, but a lot of traffic still goes to the EU. Um, so they go to, it goes to Amsterdam, goes to uh, London, goes to Germany, goes to France. So a lot of traffic still leaves, the e leaves Africa, goes to the EU. Uh, this has a lot of very horrible consequences in terms of latency, reliability, and this also impacts the end user. Uh, and there's been... Next slide. <laughs> there's been a lot of work... If you look online, you'll see that there are a lot of subsea cables uh, being put in um, over the next three or four years. I think to Africa will also show up. Uh, Google's subsea cables have already showed up. So there's a lot of work being done by content providers to create more cables. Uh, there is work being done um, also to add data centers, a lot of them showing up in South Africa and some now being proposed for Nigeria and Kenya. So there is a lot being done and one of what we've been thinking about is that how do we look at the problem from a terrestrial um, aspect? So I talked about all of the cables coming in. Um, the cables are coming in on the side. A lot of data centers are going into South Africa, but you look at content, projected content over the next couple of years. A lot of it is happening in the West. So think Nigeria. Um, 
Yeah, think I guess the mass amount of content going to come there. So then there's the question, how do you get content providers or how do you get data centers? How do you get um, CDN locations there? So uh, the data centers are being put in the South, but most of the content is projected uh, in the West. Um, if you look at all of the data centers that have been put in so far and projected, still kind of in the South. So there's this question of what does it look like to actually get connectivity uh, from the South uh, to everywhere else. Um, I think you'll see that all of the cables make it so that you basically either go around one way or you essentially go into Europe. So one question uh, there is, what does it mean to add more IXPs? What does it mean to add um, local or remote? So local pairing between IXPs and the MNOs, or what does it mean to add uh, remote pairing between different IXPs. So there, there's a lot of questions with regards to what are the set of things we can try and do terrestrially. If I may, oh. uh, just a quick question. It's unclear to me, are you saying that local traffic goes through Europe or yes. that the content is in Europe? Local traffic, both. It depends. You know why? I mean, uh, local so local traffic goes through Europe um, because of the way pairing is set up. It's often easier to pair. I guess if you take a step back from a historical perspective, most of the pairing and most of the content, well, most of the content was in Europe. All the pairing was through Europe. Um, we've gone forward uh, several decades. A lot of the content is still remote in Europe. And when there is content local, sometimes it's, it's often more cost effective to go through Europe. Um, and so I feel like just like you're baffled, I was also baffled when I found this out at first. I think uh, the first papers by Pierre were eight years ago and it hasn't changed significantly. I, I... Can we go back one slide? Yeah, sure. Whatever. There you go. Oh, thank you. I, I think what we're seeing, like if you look at the cables here, um, a lot of it initially was just uh, South Africa uh, to Europe, and then initially Nigeria and Kenya to Europe. Now you're seeing like, um, Google creating cables this way, um, Meta creating cables around this way. So there are a lot of cables kind of going around. So the problem will eventually shift that there'll be more traffic staying local, but it's not going to be going terrestrially. It's going to be going all around. So it's a different kind of problem that's maybe slightly getting better. Uh, so this is the context is a lot of traffic either goes here. Based on what's changing right now, there'll be more data centers here and some of the content might end up coming down here. But the question here is how do we get content in other places? And also how do we actually get traffic flowing within the continent itself? Next slide. Uh, and there are multiple people working on this idea of trying to keep traffic local. And the idea of keeping traffic local is both getting content providers to show up um, in different locations, getting more terrestrial cables, uh, getting the IXPs themselves to pair, the ISPs themselves to pair differently. Um, and there are a lot of different ways and different solutions. And the question is, how do you incentivize providers to show up? Um, how do you decide which policies are better um, and more importantly, how do you try and reduce the overhead of actually having people show up um, in different locations? Uh, and I think my thesis is we need a richer terrestrial system. It's not just my thesis. I feel like at this point, everyone else I've spoken to that goes to an Africa pairing summit or that shows, to, that shows up to either the Nigerian pairing or the uh, South African pairing or the Kenya pairing all have the exact same idea. So I feel like at this point, this is not an original idea. Um, and yet there's still this question of how do we actually realize it? Uh, next slide. Uh, so I wanted to make one random point. I, I think from an academic perspective and whenever I talk to people not too familiar with the continent, I think there's this question of how do we improve things? And one point I wanted to make is the continent is not monolithic. I don't think one strategy is gonna work everywhere else. And so I took a bunch of slides from Cloudflare as you can see. Uh, 
And this set of slides just shows adoption of H3, H2, H1. And you'll see, you look across the three big regions, or the three big countries, and it's quite different. Next slide. And if you look at bandwidth also across the different regions, it's, it's also um, different. Um, so when I say different regions, I'm just thinking of three countries, Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, because those are uh, the big countries where uh, a lot of people are focusing on right now. But you look at them, both from a user perspective, the users are using different uh, browsers, uh, the network has different profiles, and also um, the traffic is also a little different. So when we're thinking about strategies, it's not gonna be a one size fits all. There's gonna be a question of focusing on individual regions or individual countries. Um, but that was one point that I wanted to kind of make in terms of when we're trying to get data, it's not, let's get data from a bunch of random places. It's basically, we need to focus on individual locations and try to get a bunch of consistent data from you know one country or from one region. Next slide. Uh, so what I'm trying to get right now is data from uh, the data plane. So think traffic matrices, think counters, think usage patterns, trying to understand um, which content providers try and bring to different locations, trying to understand how do we rethink protocol. So uh, in the past, I've done a lot of work with Quick, and you'll notice, oh, I've noticed that um, performance is based not just on the protocol itself, but a bunch of other factors. And so trying to figure out um, information about the usage patterns or kind of the traffic patterns will help us figure out how to better tune a bunch of these protocols. So trying to get data um, from the data plane. So the data plane can be uh, passive data collected from um, ISPs, IXPs, or users opting into some kind of a proxy service, or it could be active data using um, ISOC probes, um, management data. So trying to get operators to fill out surveys. So in two weeks, I'll be going to Euro IX, trying to engage with a bunch of them, trying to get them to commit and fill out some surveys. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of control plane data that we already have access to that we can use to analyze uh, the routing. But I, I believe that we need data across these three spectrums to try and think about how do we make reasonable change in different countries. Um, and as I said, much of this is basically a call or a cry for help. Um, and I'm kind of open to trying to think about what other data, how to get the data, and more interestingly, um, how do we use the data to try and convince uh, different stakeholders to change how they're engaging in different countries? Uh, Can you explain what IXPDB is for some folks oh. who may not know? Uh, so IXPDB, similar to PRNDB, is a database where um, IXPs either opt in and provide some information or they use an automation tool that provides information um, about uh, the PRN information and, and roughly about their size uh, and some other random data. Uh, next slide. All right, last slide, I guess. Uh, so you look at the continent over the last five years and potentially over the next five years also, a lot of change is inspired by large content providers who I love because I love Netflix and Meta. Um, but it would be very interesting to think about things from the end user perspective, not just in terms of one large content provider, what do the end users themselves need? Uh, there's a lot of work to do digital transformation of services, uh, looking at digital payment, digital health in different countries. So when you think about things from their perspective, what are their requirements? Um, a lot of the content provider centric change are these subsea cables. Um, I suspect for a lot of the other use cases, there is more of a need to look at the terrestrial aspect of it too. Um, my pet peeve, it's not just one solution. Uh, we're going to have to break things up and try and think about either region-specific solutions or context-aware solutions. Uh, and I'm trying to get a lot of data, both active measurement data and passive measurement data. Um, I need help with everything. And I think that's, that's it. Excellent. We have about six minutes for Q&A. Okay. And I think you had a question earlier about why some of the traffic wasn't, um, was not staying local. If you don't have an internet exchange point, sometimes your traffic isn't going to stay local, right? They were tromboning their traffic through subsea cables in a lot of African countries. 
And so it would transit through, it would go through the subsea cable, come through Europe and go back to have two ISPs talk to each other in the same country. So by, by building an internet exchange point in country, you're exchanging traffic totally that's, neutrally over that so fabric. That's clear, but I would be interested oh, sorry. in uh, understanding better what are the obstacles to doing local peering. Ah, are they okay. social? Are they economical? Are they technical? So I, I think all of the above, and this goes back to this whole, like there's no one solution, there's no one problem also. So there are some places where there are no IXPs. Uh, there is a dominant ISP. And so when you're using that domin dominant ISP, you will basically use whatever routes it uses, which is to go through Europe. Um, in some other cases, when there is a content provider location, there the content provider location isn't just one IXP, uh, one ISP. Uh, if you're in a second ISP, you will not get content from your competitor, competitor. So you will have to get content externally. So there are a bunch of um, a bunch of different reasons. Some of them are kind of uh, the ISPs are not as friendly as they are in the West. There is still a bit of adversarial interactions between them, for one. And the other is, um, I think, bytes per dollar. Yeah, let's go with bytes per euro. Bytes per euro is still cheaper to kind of go up than to go on a terrestrial link to your neighbor. If, if you do have those links. Excellent. We've got three people in the queue. So I just want to recognize, um, Mallory, you're first up. Hey, thanks. Thanks for your talk. And I just, I really love being able to come to Gaia. It's always so, so interesting. I guess it's a pretty general question. So I appreciate if you don't have a specific answer to this, but what are, thinking about the solution space, what are some of the things you feel like the IETF in particular could do better on when it comes to improving the networking landscape in, in Africa? Thanks. So I don't know if this is a standardization question. Um, I, I think kind of going back to uh, what are some of the underlying issues, some of it is trying to find ways to create communities. So I, I think you look at the US, we have Nanog. Mm -hmm. Nanog happens in like every three months, a lot of operators show up and they talk and they try and find ways to do pairing. Or you look at um, in the EU, there's every country has a bunch of these. I think the question is how do you try to change uh, the culture is one of the things mm -hmm. out there. The other is how do you try to um, a, incentivize uh, some of these large providers. So I know um, Meta shows up here, Akamai shows up here. Yeah. Um, and I don't think those are the right examples because they're already working <laughs> in Africa. So like, how do you get um, Disney or how do you get um, Amazon to go outside of South, South Africa? Um, so I guess, how do you try to go in and promote a culture of like these nogs that exist in the West is one way. I don't think it's like jumping and standardizing. I think it's going and trying to replicate, not replicate, but find ways to create some uh, condu conducive culture to more cooperation. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And like there's the IEPG and maybe more network operators from Africa could come. Because I think at the end of the day, um, actually the operators, the companies, the telcos in Africa probably have different and in my view, probably more interesting problems to solve than like gigantic multinationals, but that's just my assumption, but we won't know until there's more engagement. So anyway, right. So I think, okay, we have three more people in the queue. Okay. If I'll we could, see. yeah. Can we do speed round? Like, yes, yes. yes. All right. All right. <laughs> so I think we're not going to get them to come to us. Uh, you look at the last two months and the next month, uh, there was a huge parent summit in Ghana and there is one in Nigeria and there's one in South Africa. And a lot of the providers had to go to all three of them. And I asked the question, well, if you went to Ghana, why wasn't, why do you have to go back to the next country that's next door? It's because a lot of the providers will not show up. They don't have the budget to travel. So basically if you're a, a, a lot of the uh, operators don't have the budget to travel. So if you're a provider, you basically have to go to every country to engage with them. So I, I think the question is how can we try and go there without traveling to every country? So next question. Next, uh, Chi Chang. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Chi from uh, Zhongguan Sun Lab, China. And uh, 
actually, uh, we have uh, have been doing some research on, on Leo satellites, Leo constellations, with many universities. And I believe with Leo constellation, you can have just one operator, one like a CDM provider, which can cover all the continent. Every country, you will have a. Uh, at the same time, you will have many, many uh, satellites over each country, and uh, you can cover even the whole planet. So if you have that uh, constellation, the one mm. uh, covering all of the planet, will there be any other important factors? Or so is, I, the, is the infrastructure the most uh, critical side? I, I think this is a very complex question that we will have to take offline. Yeah. But I've been looking at Starlink, and I can say, the answer from like one perspective is most likely going to be no. I don't think it's the one provider has the right incentives to do something that works well across the whole globe. Uh, and I think you look at when there is a monopoly, it's generally not a good thing. So, so I said that's a very complicated question, and I don't think I have like a speed round We're to doing answer speed that. Round. So Vesna's up next. Thank you, Chi. Um, perhaps maybe you two can connect after. So um, if we can keep the questions short, the answers short, we can get Randy and Vesna in. So Vesna, you're up. Okay. Thank you, Chi. Hi, uh, I'm Vesna from RIPE NCC. I wanted to offer active measurements, RIPE Atlas. Mm. Yeah, so we've been working with ISOC <laughs> and the probes have RIPE Atlas on them. So okay. but I would like some credits so I can <laughs> yes. come bother you afterwards. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> and uh, we also uh, do a lot of work for um, uh, NOGs supporting the local communities. So we have uh, a lot of experience and material that you can uh, I would take also from love. us. And uh, we offer the training and education, which is also open uh, for anybody to use. So uh, we can also talk about that later. Okay, thank you. Okay, Randy Bush in the queue. You're up. Randy Bush, hi, Jay and Arcus. Um, I just want to mention that we have spent decades getting network operators groups active in Africa. Telling Africans to come to Nanog seems a little silly. I agree with that. I think that's also what I said, maybe <laughs> more politely. Um. I think there's violent agreement, Randy. <laughs> um. Good point, though. OK, so thank you, Theo. Theo's here, if anyone wants to chat with Theo. Also a plug for a former organization I worked with, the Internet Society. There's some great papers on the peering problem and the challenges in Africa on the continent with them, how things have improved over time with IXPs, and lots of meetings like the African Peering and Interconnection Forum. OK, so I'm going to stop this slide share. Everyone thank Theo. Oh, I'm going to have to redo this. Um, okay. I had uploaded the slides earlier, but this one is not there. Okay. Hmm. Oh, no, you're here. Well, happiness. There we go. Does this maybe? No? Yeah. I try. Yeah, try. Give it a go. Um, I'll do it for you. Okay, so I'm going to start. I'm a bit tired, so I made some notes to make sure I'm going to be on track. Uh, I'm not checking Instagram on my phone, so don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Andre. I'm the CTO of this organization called Commit Global. Um, just a little background about me. I don't have any kind of technical education. I have a bachelor's degree in journalism, uh, a master's degree in anthropology, but about, I think, 11 years ago, the nerd in me won and decided it wanted to do software development. Uh, next slide. So um, who we are, a little bit of a background on what this, this nonprofit does. Um, seven years ago, while I was in mid-transitioning between, uh, between careers, um, I met this handful of people that created an NGO called Code for Romania. 
I'm initially from Romania. I used to live there for, for, for quite a while. Um, and while looking for, for places where I can contribute uh, the technical knowledge that, I, that, I've, that I've gathered in those years, I, I found this, this group of independent, nonpartisan, non-political, non-profits, non-governmental organization, the, the four negatives that, that kind of define us. Um, this uh, organization came up in, in a wave of anger that, um, that surged throughout the Romanian society after the failed state's response to the collective nightclub fire where we had a lot of our peers, a lot of our friends and family die in, in a fire that could have been prevented. Um, and this group of people sort of quag coagulated around the idea that we can sort of fill in the gaps and make better where the state cannot do it or where the civil society doesn't have the tools at their disposal to, to do it. So in the first four years of, of its existence, this organization managed with like peanuts of a budget to uh, coagulate around 2,000 volunteers. We clocked around, I think it was over... 350,000 work hours, volunteer work hours from developers, designers, uh, lawyers, anybody that could contribute anything to some of the applications that we were doing. Um, in the meantime, we're over 3,000 volunteers, and I think we kind of stopped trying to estimate the, the number of hours that we're working because it's, it's, it's a lot. Uh, we are currently the largest maintainer of... Um, uh, we're maintaining the largest pool of solution in the tech for social good space. I'm going to come back to this later and explain explain what it does. Um, but as you can imagine, working with the civil society in Romania and working with uh, with the authorities, we we ended up encountering countless Cinderella stories. And you know how it goes. It's like this lovely lady loses a shoe. Uh, the prince finds uh, this needlessly expensive shoe. Uh, the prince find it, finds it and goes on this epic quest to, to try and see who the shoe belongs to. Uh, after many, many failed attempts, they, the prince finally finds Cinderella. They live happily ever after. End of story, right? Next slide. <laughs> the only problem is that uh, a lot of people had to suffer while fitting that shoe before Cinderella was actually found. Um, so for a long time, uh, in our experience, this is what technology has been doing. Um, we developed shoes that did not fit. And uh, time and time again in crisis situations, um, we grab what we have available and we try to sort of make do with the software that we have. We try to monkey wrench any, any changes that we need to have for it to work. Um, and we kind of try to adapt it to situations that none of us has seen before, right? So. None of the engineers, none of the designers, none of the developers were confronted with, with situations that they now have to solve. Um, just a second, I'm sorry. Um, regardless of the, the angle that, that we, um, we look at it, we, we kind of keep looking as a society towards technology as a means to an end and not necessarily as an enabler, which, which we, we, we think is wrong. We are not ready to be digital by design in our intervention. And in many cases, the technology that we use, um, to the best of our knowledge, due to a ton of factor, makes things worse, adds vulnerabilities, and poorly designed software can make things worse. Um, the reality is that in most situations, we don't actually use technology strategically. So we end up developing a lot of blind spots that um, if, if we end up developing so many blind spots, we're, we're going to be as if we were in, in the dark. So let me tell you a bit about the, our, our experience and, and the way that our humanitarian infrastructure came, uh, came to be. So... None of this is of, of the chapter of, of the following slides that I'm gonna gonna present. This isn't firsthand experience that, that I've lived because I'm not. I wasn't in Romania anymore. I used to. I have to maintain servers more than maintain research and, and uh, liaisons with with people on the ground. So this is all information gathered from from the rest of my team. So, as you know. Um, 
there was a word that started last year in, in Ukraine. Romania is uh, sharing its largest border with Ukraine. And as you can imagine, we've had uh, quite a large influx of, of refugees coming from Ukraine looking to either settle in Romania while this whole thing blows over or um, just go towards family wherever else in Europe they, they might have family. So when the war started in Ukraine on the 21st of, Fe uh, 21st of February, our team was just recovering after two very gruesome years of maintaining the COVID-19 infrastructure um, um, for, for the entirety of Romania. Um, we were overworked, we were burnt out, we were beyond tired. But at 10 in the morning, I've had uh, a, colleague, a volunteer, a friend of mine, calling me saying, okay, so when do we assemble? And this, this actually meant when does the task force start? The task force for us is, is a mechanism, a set of procedures, uh, rules, processes that our team uses uh, and deploys whenever we have to in, engage in immediate responses to a crisis. Um, we already knew what to do because we had already deployed this task force once for, for COVID. We were, we were doing it again now. So just so you understand the context of Romania, a bit. Um, it, this is a country that's pretty much in the middle of everything, right? So from public service uh, quality, healthcare, education, we're not the best by any measure, but we're definitely not the worst either. So it's it's in this this average land uh, where where most things happen. And as you may guess, it's pretty far. It's it's a place that's pretty far from like a sustainable digital transformation uh, process. We have a lot of legacy systems, uh, a lot of um, paper databases. Um, at some point, the Ministry of Health was uh, proud that it wasn't ever hacked before. And my, my sort of uh, snarky comment to that was it's kind of hard to hack a pile of, of paper <laughs> sitting somewhere in, in, a, um, in an archive, right? So. Um, Nobody kind of also had any experience dealing with humanitarian crises in, in Romania because we hadn't really experienced them so close to home up, up to that. None of our NGOs in the civil society were humanitarian, but they kind of had to be overnight. Um, so we brought, uh, we started by bringing the expert in the room and I'm not talking about the solutions architect. I'm not talking about the designer or developer. Um, we bought the, exper the, the expert on, on humanitarian crisis to tell us what the scenarios are, what are we looking at, how can we best respond to, to this situation. In, in parallel to this, we were mapping the response that the, Romania was that, that the Romanian government was officially preparing. We got in touch within hours with um, the Department for Emergency Situations, the central government and the UN agencies that were already uh, on the border with, uh, with Ukraine. And last but not least, we also got in touch with the civil society um, who was already on the ground uh, going to the borders in support of the authorities. Um, it's, it took us 48 hours to, to launch our first solution, which was a single multilingual uh, available in Ukrainian, Russian, English, and Romanian entry point for every single refugee or first responder to access where they can find all the information they need from like documents, um, services, aids, access to verified housing, medical care, anything they, they might have needed. Um, but this wasn't just one platform among all, all the others. Um, for the first time, we managed to bring together an, an unprecedented coalition of actors. Uh, it was the government working together with UN agency, with civil society organizations that agreed to all speak on one single voice, on one single platform, to put uh, together all their communication capacity behind it. We had the shared infrastructure, we saved time, um, funding, maintenance efforts, and enhanced the uh, outreach capacity in, in, in seconds. Uh, we also managed to make things a lot more clear for people wanting to access this information because they didn't have to search for 
whatever fully optimized website some government agency has or so for some very hard to discover link buried somewhere in a very deep structure of, um, of a humanitarian organization's uh, massive, massive website. Um, it was also used as a, um, as a way of gaining trust uh, that the information is, re is reliable, is verified, it's provided by, by experts. Um, we made it accessible, flexible, easy to reach and available 100% uh, of the time. So the second uh, snapshot of this, this history is at the, um, the refugee center. So the second step for us was to ensure proper aid infrastructure. Uh, seven days had passed since, since the war, uh, seven days passed since the war had started. We managed to finish two fairly complex uh, platforms that ensured access to housing and access to, um, to other types of, of resources. Mm -hmm. Um, the housing platform is, is one that's very dear to my heart. And I think one of the most important of, of our, um, uh, solution ecosystem, uh, overall, because it's aimed to give the authorities the means to verify the identity of people offering accommodation to refugees so that we, we made the best effort we we could and the best efforts that that we we managed to find through our research to try to put the brakes as much as possible on any attempt at human trafficking exploiting this uh, this situation so we're we're basically uh, the properties and their owners were, were verified against police databases they were checked by authorities the places were checked to see if they actually existed um, and this is a thing that before this platform, the authorities were either not doing or doing with a, pre with a printed spreadsheet uh, going from place to place in a, in a very small capacity. Um, we also provided training for every single responder and uh, we ensure 24-7 uh, support for every single issue. Um, this is the the reward, most rewarding and most exhausting part of the task force is that somebody, some of our colleagues would be available to any questions, any time. And whenever there was anything that we could solve technically, we would do it on our side. But most of the time we figured out it's not a technical issue. It's always, it's mostly either a training issue, a communication issue, um, or something that can be trained, that can be solved um, without writing a single, a single line of code. Um, remember that I told you about the blind spots? So we were preparing this like super scalable, um, uh, super resilient infrastructure powered by, by AWS. Um, I would like to nerd out with you on, on all the, the things that I put in there. But the problem is that we were getting DDoSed. It was fine. We were resolving it. We were in touch with Amazon. They were helping us figure it out. But we got hacked. And we didn't get hacked the way that you think. Um, somebody printed a sticker with a different QR code in, in the refugee center pointing people to another website. So uh, it's, it's that easy. There's no amount of firewall, no amount of computing power I could throw against a different QR code. Uh, we luckily managed to figure it out very, very quickly because we had people on the ground all the time uh, in, in the refugee center and, and at the border. Um, but this just goes to show how easy it is to hack the system and that we always need to be able to, to respond. And it's not always the, let's say, the most obvious, uh, most obvious way to get hacked. Next one. Got about five yeah, yeah, I'm I'm terrible at this. That's I don't okay. do presentations that that much. Don't worry. Okay, so uh, the next one is the hospital um, because you know life doesn't just stop because you're in a war. Um, do you know what it feels like for a cancer patient to decide to leave the country to go to a country where they don't speak the language, or what it feels like for a person that's living with HIV? 
um, or like you're in the middle of your vaccination plan and all of a sudden you cannot continue it or go to a gynecologist with a translator in the room. Um, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, it's, it's critical to provide access to all the infrastructure for the people that, that need it when they need it. Um, Romania has very few NGOs that do anything for people with HIV. The largest one, so they get an idea, has three people working for it. Yet they manage to service over 2,000 people a year. Um, we, we managed to, to figure out a way in which these people could just not work with the spreadsheets that they were using before. We, we managed to build an application for them where they could have like a sort of centralized case management system. And we built it in such a modular way that we could redeploy it in just a few hours for other organizations that, um, aside from treating cancer patients, uh, they were also treating uh, patients, uh, people diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis uh, for reproductive health services and, and more. This, this, this for us was one, one, one pretty big success. Uh, next one. And then there's the states. This is the number of new ordinances that were issued by the Romanian government within 12 days of the war starting. Uh, it's, it was impossible for us to keep up speaking the language. Um, imagine how, how much more difficult it is uh, as, as a refugee. Because, um, I mean, this, the old text there just basically governs your existence in this new country that you don't really know anything about, right? Um, so what we did is we followed the example, the, the same pattern that we used for the initial information platform, and we we just created a platform that we is nothing super fancy. It's just basically a website that has verified and translated content on what the what these specific laws pertaining to refugees say. Again, in Romanian, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, and English. Uh, next one. Um, I think I'm going to skip this one. Okay, so this this is basically our mission. Um, it's it can be even more summarized to the idea of leave no vulnerable person behind, leave no NGO behind. Um, so for us, we, we, we've taken on this mission of trying to unlock the promise of tech for social good and try to, to fix all of the realities that, um, that, I've, uh, that I've mentioned in, in the previous slide. We aim to identify, maintain, and bring up to standard and deploy critical pieces of civic infrastructure around the world. We train and grow the actors on the ground to use that tech properly, because it's not enough just to throw technology at people you need to make sure they can use it. Um, we want to, and we need to grant access to technology to everybody working with the, every vulnerable group as soon as possible, ideally yesterday. Next. Um, so why do we do this? Um, in, in, in every airplane announcement, the, the safety instructions say, put your own mask on before helping others. Um, there is a huge pressure on in-country organizations to deliver immediate relief whenever any kind of crisis like this shows up, and they just are not set up to to succeed for this. Um, in, in in cases like like this one with Ukraine, you would have external agencies that would uh, bring an, a huge influx of money into small organizations that scale overnight from like a handful of people to maybe over 100 people working on, on the ground. And then as soon as the, the more acute part of the, the crisis goes away, so does the funding. So these organizations end up deflating as, as a balloon, uh, not really knowing exactly what to, what to, do, uh, what to do next. So um, because these organizations are almost always focusing on their beneficiaries and not on their internal health that much, this leaves them very vulnerable after each and every um, heavy intervention that they, they, they have to make. Next. You have about two more minutes. Yeah, okay. so um, this, is, this is pretty much the core of what we consider to be the infrastructure for good. 
So for us, this is a body of open source digital solutions that are built either by us or by somebody else. It doesn't matter as long as it's open source and integrated strategically into ecosystems meant to tackle a critical global issue and made available as such on a continuous basis uh, to NGOs to grow their effectiveness and response capacity. So we, we have these three pillars, these, these three core elements of infrastructure for good, which for us are open source. And because this is this infrastructure for good is deployed, built and maintained in the public interest to serve the vulnerable, its elements are quintessentially required to be open source to ensure equal access, public scrutiny and sustainability, even if something happens and, and we cannot continue working as an organization, it's very important to us that our work doesn't just go to waste or doesn't um, get lost somewhere in like some private Git repos that nobody has access to. Um, the next one is is the common element. Some of some of the elements of the infrastructure for goods are used by multiple stakeholders that are intervening on a given topic um, where a central coordination is is critical. So the mission of, of Commit Global is to consolidate and deploy and administer this this common digital infrastructure in cooperation with all of the relevant stakeholders. Um, the last uh, core element, the shared element, um, we want to be able to, to create and centrally maintain a digital infrastructure which can be deployed to multiple stakeholders and across different geographies. Um, so it doesn't make any sense for us to, to keep our, all of our solutions in, in Europe, sort of to, 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 to uh, segue back to, to to Theo's talk, um, it's uh, critical that if we have, um, a, I don't know, any kind of humanitarian crisis or we need to start building capacity for NGOs um, in, in Africa, that we can, we have the, the, the required technology and the required tools to, to deploy it as close as possible to, um, to the relevant uh, piece. And I think I'm gonna have another one last slide that I can, yep. that I can show before I run out of time. Another one, and another one, and this one. This, uh, that's no, right. yep. wait, that's one too much. So this is in, in, in a snapshot, the infrastructure for goods um, system as, as we envision it. We, we practically created this setup of three interconnected uh, solution, uh, ecosystems of solutions. So, um, <laughs> The idea is that you cannot sustainably have one without the other. There's no humanitarian infrastructure if I don't have the civic infrastructure to, um, to support the NGOs and the civil society organizations that are making this uh, humanitarian intervention possible. Um, so for us, everything starts at capacity building for, for NGOs. Um, We've built, uh, we already have, uh, just to give you like a few, a few quick numbers, we already have um, in the capacity building ecosystem in, civil, in civic infrastructure, we have a number of 18 solutions that we're already providing to, to NGOs that are from volunteer management to financial management to inter an internal elections platform uh, that uh, makes the, the, the election process transparent and fully democratic. Uh, data viz interfaces, database management integrated with whatever other tools they might be using just to make sure that we can get them spending time and all of their energy on helping the beneficiaries and not having to worry about what tools they should be using internally. And you know how, how can I make this spreadsheet bigger and better? Um, the humanitarian assistance ecosystem consists as of this year of 27 different blocks, which for us are web and, and mobile apps uh, that work together to address the various types of needs of displaced populations that ensure access to information, to health services, to resources, to accommodation and, and more. Um, this ecosystem will, will grow in, in the next years. Um, and will be redeployed for every new geography where, where uh, we manage to, uh, to support uh, an ongoing uh, crisis or an ongoing uh, uh, intervention. Um, 
I think I'm going to stop here because I have some more, but it, it gets way into more details and I think it might be nice to answer some questions. Yep, we've got about five minutes for questions. And just so people know what the run of show is, after that, Matt Ford will speak about a new index that the Internet Society has put together on internet resilience. And then after that, we have a panel on remote peering. And we are very lucky to have um, someone from the IX and Czech, and Czech here with us. So Jan, uh, Jan Sorts, you're in the queue. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jan Georges, Six Connect and Global Nog Alliance. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing all this. It's much appreciated. Um, but when you, when you mentioned that you got hacked and DDoSed, so at Six Connect, we built uh, the, Anycast, the global Anycast network just for fun, for us, right? And then um, the, uh, the, the, the war started in Ukraine. And at the Global Nog Alliance, we started the Keep Ukraine Connected project and started shipping equipment to the operators to keep people connected. And we also offered the .UA TLD to reinforce the infrastructure to put the .UA on, on our Anycast because it was there, it was built, it, it, it was working. And to my big surprise, we didn't get hacked, attacked, or DDoSed out of the existence. And I, I still don't understand why, but probably we were, we were just lucky. I, uh, for, us, uh, for us also, uh, the, the hacking wasn't a constant thing. I, I think somebody just uh, tried to probe us a couple of times, and they saw that it was, it was holding up, and we, we never saw anything like it happening again. So, uh, in, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say if it was like a, a, a concentrated attack, was it state sponsored, was it just <coughs> some kid that was bored and trying to see, you know, does Code for Romania manage to, to keep its stuff running or not. Um, but I found, I found the QR code a lot more disturbing than all the extra packets that, that we got for, uh, for some of the platforms. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing it anyway. Thank you. Um, Andre's here through the next couple hours, so mm -hmm. if people want to chat with him about what Commit's doing, that'd be great. Is there anyone else in the queue? We've got two to three minutes for this, so, okay. All right, well then, thank you very thank much, you. Andre. Thanks for what you're doing. <laughs> Matt Ford. <clears throat> Matt, that, that's you, yeah? Those are my slides. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Matt Ford. I'm a technology program manager at the Internet Society, and I have a few slides for you about the Internet Resilience Index. Um, are you, I think you're driving the slides for me, Jane, so if I could have the you next one. Matt. So before I get into the Resilience Index itself, I thought I'd just mention that this is a component of work that um, we are hosting at Internet Society Pulse. So if you're not familiar with this, you can go to pulse.internetsociety.org. And I'd encourage you to explore um, the various tools and the content that's available there. Um, we are um, amalgamating, curating, um, collecting data from uh, multiple sources to provide Internet Society Pulse. We hope it's of interest and use to a broad uh, audience of, um, of, of Internet users. And if you have feedback, um, there are lots of ways you can send that to us, and I'll, I'll get to that shortly. Uh, slide, please. So on Internet Society Pulse, there are a number of different uh, sort of tracks or topics that we're covering internet shutdowns, where, there are, where, they, where they're occurring. So we're kind of curating an archive of information about shutdown events when they occurred, um, related documents and um, community uh, insight and so forth. There's a, a calculator, which we've called net loss, which um, can provide a sort of um, a rough indication of the economic impact of an internet shutdown. And you can plug in countries and dates and types of shutdowns and get, get insight into the economic impacts of these events. On the technologies page, we're tracking the deployment of technologies critical for the evolution of the internet. But we have a page about uh, market concentration where we have some different metrics related to how services are concentrated on the internet. 
And then, um, of course, we have um, some pages on internet resilience, which is what I'm going to focus on today. Slide, please. So um, the general question, how robust is the internet ecosystem? And the slide, please. So the definition that we've d defined for this, uh, for this work for resilience is that a resilient internet connection is one that maintains an acceptable level of service in the face of faults and challenges to normal operation. Um, it's very hard to measure internet resilience. Um, and at this point, I should highlight that this work was led by my colleagues, Kevin Chege and Amrish Fokir. And Amrish is in the room, so this is his 10 minute warning that if I get any difficult questions, I will defer them to him. Um, but it, this is a hard thing to measure, right? Um, resilience is, is, is kind of an abstract concept. We've tried to sort of pin it down a bit with this, with this sentence. Um, but it's, it's not trivial to do this, right? And so on the next slide, um, uh, you'll see how we've tried to approach the problem. So we've uh, defined this index, which is based on um, some best current practices of, of building these kind of uh, technology indices. Um, uh, it's very similar to work done by the UN, uh, the World Bank, and the GSMA in terms of how it's composed. Um, and we, so we have combined multiple public data sets and, and defined these four pillars of a res resilient internet. Um, so the infrastructure, um, obviously we've already heard about that quite a bit in our first presentation today. So where are, you know, are, 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 you know what, what is the quality of the physical infrastructure that actually provides internet connectivity in a country? And then the performance of that infrastructure um, in terms of you know, basic speed tests, packet loss, latency, and so forth. Um, the security of that infrastructure, so to what extent is it hosting malicious content or being attacked? And the market readiness of, of um, service provision in that country, so how competitive is that marketplace, which relates to the affordability to end users, of course. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, the uh, the details of these pillars, uh, how the metrics uh, fit into them, how we've uh, how we handle, for example, missing data, how we normalize all of this data, and the weighting that we apply to these metrics is all detailed in this document, um, which sets out our methodology for doing this. Um, so the URL was on the previous slide. There's a QR code here if you if that's your your preferred way of getting uh, to documents like this, um, but if you're interested in in the, in the thorny details, they're all they're all there. Uh, slide, please. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, that there are four pillars. I'll just go through these quickly. So infrastructure, we're looking at um, the you know, the cable ecosystem, uh, the fixed infrastructure um, with data from the ITU and the World Bank. We've got data from the GSMA to look at the the mobile infrastructure. Um, and we're also looking at the infrastructure that was being met, was being discussed earlier, right? This this key component of interconnection, IXPs, and the data centers that support those. And we get that data from from uh, PCH, Peering DB, and data center map. Um, slide, please. And then um, in terms of performance, we get a lot of data from UCLA on both fixed and mobile networks. Um, I think I'm right in saying that we also um, um, uh, fill in the blanks with some of these data where we, we where we don't have sufficient data or we can augment it with data from MLab. Um, uh, and so so that's so the, the the performance pillar and then the next slide the security pillar which also where we also include a, a number of enabling technologies like IPv6 adoption HTTPS and secure DNS um, as well as um, the insight that we get from manners in terms of um, the routing hygiene of operators in a given country and the security related information that we can get from um, some various sources as well. And then the final pillar on the next slide is market readiness. Um, so we've got a number of different sources for this. Um, the, uh, the way in which these indicators are composed is, is um, well, probably very familiar to you, if, to you if you're an economist. But um, uh, if, if terms like HHI and Gini coefficients are not familiar there, and there's more detail, detail about that in the, uh, in the methodology. 
but essentially these are ways of kind of boiling down market shares of, of lots of different um, players to a to a simple measurement of of you know inequality or, or equality um, so th those are the data sources and the different pillars that we that we're using and then next slide please um, th they are uh, essentially presented on the on the page itself, uh, the resilience page on Pulse, and you can get different views of this, right? So you can take the global outlook and see how, how um, at an overall level or pillar by pillar, um, the the results differ from country to country. Um, and you know, looking at that, it's perhaps not surprising to learn that um, the African content um, has some of the least resilient internet services uh, around the world. On um, the next slide. Um, you can see that you can also using the chart view, you can get, you can dig into specific regions, you can get regional comparisons and sub-regional comparisons. Um, and so there I'm just highlighting the, the results that we have for, for Czechia. And again, you can select whether you want to, to focus on, you know, which of the four pillars you want to focus on in that, in that view. And in the next slide, um, you can see that if you drill down to a single country, then you basically start to get into the full resilience report or the full details of each of these um, composite indicators for that for that country. And there are, there are tools there, so you can um, you can download these reports as PDFs. You can copy the URL to share it in email or whatever. Or there are social links as well. Um, and on the next slide, um, yeah. So I'll fight. So almost final slide, I think. Um, so as I said, the data is drawn from many different public sources. And so, you know, it, it, it to some extent, it, it's as good or as useful as as the methodologies used by those sources. And uh, they're, they're typically updated annually. So this isn't, you know, like super, super fresh, hot off the press data. But again, that's, you know, that's not really the point. We're sort of looking at long term trends and comparisons between regions and countries. Um, if, if we don't have indicators for um, for more than 25 countries, then we don't include that data. Um, and, you know, and it's certainly true that, you know, for example, where the performance measurements are concerned that without in-country measurements, it's it's quite difficult to validate this data. So as I say, it's it's as good or as bad as the, as the sources that we're using, and we accept that. Um, we do process this data quite heavily. It's all normalized, and we do apply a, a somewhat arbitrary, but again, it's you know we have a justification for it, a weighting to to the data, and that's described in the methodology. And I guess the the highlight or the the sort of headline point about the index is not so much that you know um, any specific country scores, you know, a specific percentage on on security or performance, for example. Uh, it's more about being able to compare countries and being able to engage, especially decision makers, in understanding the different components that go to create a resilient internet, and understanding where in their country or in re or in their region where there might be specific um, weaknesses or specific areas that, that would be benefit from from attention, perhaps some policy attention, perhaps some economic investment that would help to improve internet resilience in that country or region. Uh, on the next slide, I think uh, I mentioned that there's an API for this data. So if you are interested in uh, benefiting from the work that we've done, collating all of this information and applying the methodology that I mentioned, then please drop email to that pulse at isoc.org address and we can uh, get you plugged into the API. And on my final slide, I think, uh, yes, you can also subscribe to the Pulse newsletter if you're if you're interested. That comes out once a month, so it's not a huge amount of email. Um, hopefully, there'll be something of interest in there. We'll certainly have. Uh, it certainly will we'll highlight any blog posts about resilience that um, that we post on Pulse there as well. So that's what I have a quick quick sort of lightning overview of the of the resilience index on on Pulse. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And if I can't, I hope that Amrish will be able to. I see Vesna in the queue. Thanks, for Vesna. It. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Vesna, you're up. And the queue's open. If Hi, uh, thank questions. you. Thank you for this. Um, uh, uh, I'm Vesna, and on a personal, uh, in a personal capacity, I would like to suggest the fifth pillar, which is sustainability. Uh, it's really hard to measure. I see that you are focused on actually getting 
measurements for all these pillars and, and a lot of data. But I think uh, sustainability should be a big part of the resilience if this is what you are uh, trying to measure. So either you can maybe include it in some of the existing ones or, or have another completely new pillar. Yeah, that, that's a very, very good point, especially given the work that um, the IAB have been um, spinning up recently on, on e-impact. Um, I, I wonder though whether, uh, I wonder what data sources, if you're familiar with any data sources that would pertain to that at the moment, or is, would you think this would be, this would be trying to encourage the creation of new data sources so that we could actually populate a pillar like that? Yeah, I think uh, the, the latter. So I don't yeah. think there are existing data sources, but we could work on them together. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. Thank you for that. Excellent. And um, Matt, thanks so much. You've got lots of great data in the slide deck. And if people are interested, have a look at the website, um, upload the QR code, and subscribe to the Pulse newsletter. Is there anyone else that has questions for Matt? OK. Well, I think now we'll turn over to the remote peering uh, panel. Good job, Matt. And I'm going to ask um, Adam to come up to the table. And you can sit up here with me, Adam. And this is kind of a hybrid panel, some remote, some <laughs> online. And Curtis, over to you. Yeah, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm a little worried, so you're not going to see my camera uh, on uh, the data quality here, given the, the communication earlier. Um, can each of the panelists speak? I see Amrish has uh, got a beautiful green screen behind him. Um, but uh, can you uh, just make sure that your audio is working? Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Brian? See, we have Brian in the chat. Are in the in the room, so Brian Longway. I've been emailing with him back and forth, so I know he's around. We'll figure that out in a second here. Um, maybe the first thing to do um, is just have the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, please do this uh, somewhat briefly. Uh, well, I see Brian is in the chat now. Well, can you check out your um, your uh, audio? Oh, but apparently not as a speaker. Sounds like we have a technical thing to work out with Brian. Uh, it looks Brian, like Jane is. You can, your camera's on, okay. So let me ping the meet echo folks. Oh, we got a Brian. Bravo. Thank you, Meet Echo. OK. Can you try talking? We can't hear you yet. It does get to see my beautiful face. Uh, so nothing yet, Brian. Keep keep plugging away and seeing if it's on, on your side or our side. We'll have the technical folks go into it. But before that, um, we'll have Brian as the last one to introduce himself. Uh, otherwise, um, for the two other panelists, if we can lightly introduce ourselves, um, uh, probably a minute or two at most. Um, and then um, I'll give some context on the remote hearing discussion that happened the last uh, Gaia. Um, and then this is obviously a bit of our experiment in having kind of more of a discussion-oriented format here. Um, uh, at the at Gaia, um, and then um, we'll start to, to to poke them with questions. And I really hope that the audience, both uh, present and remote, uh, is uh, feels empowered to ask said questions of, of these panelists. So I guess we'll start with Amrish. Would you like to give yourself an introduction? Thank you, Curtis. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Amrish Fokia. I work at the Internet Society as an internet measurement and data expert. Um, my role basically is to understand the global trends uh, of the internet, uh, whether it is internet shutdowns, uh, connectivity, um, internet resilience. So I've been working recently a lot on the internet resilience index, which Matt just presented. Um, I'm also involved in the peering uh, infrastructure team at the Internet Society. So at the Internet Society, we uh, work a lot to um, um, 
strengthen the local ecosystem in different countries. So one way to do that is to actually help people set up uh, peering infrastructure. Um, so uh, as, a, as an internet tech measurement expert, what I do is I run analysis on um, how, how, how is peering, how is the peering effic efficiency uh, changing uh, over time. Um, so we collect data from um, uh, route collectors, uh, especially PCH route collectors or, or route views, uh, and, and, and wrangle this data and try to see uh, good or bad things happening. And um, yeah, uh, remote peering uh, is an important uh, um, phenomenon. Uh, some people might like it, some people might not like it, uh, but it's there. So it's quite, uh, it, it would be interesting to talk about it today. Thank you. Great. Uh, Brian, you want to try audio again real quick? Still nothing. There is some guidance from the Meet Echo in the chat, Brian. So maybe while you take a look at that, we could have Adam introduce himself. Hey. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Golatsky, and I'm working for NixCZ, which is local internet exchange in Prague. Uh, we start in Prague, but in the meantime, we expand to Bratislava, which is capital city of Slovakia. Uh, you know, Czech and Slovak was a one country a few decades ago, so uh, we have a lot of similar content. So we decide to, to move to the Slovakia as well, because a lot of uh, networks and contents have a common interest to share their their traffic together so uh, right now i can see we are czechoslovakia again in scope of data and because of the redundant link uh, passing through the vienna so we also are uh, in the vienna which is close this uh, vienna and bratislava is two closest city on the world i mean capital cities it's about 60 kilometers far and one millisecond over the fiber. So at the moment we are Triangle, Prague, Bratislava and Vienna. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're a little noisy, but that's, I think, fine. So uh, okay. please go ahead. Okay, so I guess this is introductions. Okay, Introduce the headset and the mic are not working. All right, so my name is Brian Longway. I've been um, sort of building internet in Africa for the last 27 years, uh, starting in Kenya, uh, helping set up the Kenya Internet Exchange Point, and then working across the continent, have worked helping about 14 other countries uh, set up the internet exchange points. Um, I currently uh, live and work in Malawi, where I run a startup, small startup internet service provider. Um, and, you know, Malawi is about 20 years behind the rest of the world as far as technology is concerned. So um, this is a very interesting topic for me, and I'm interested to sort of see what I can learn, but also share from our experiences um, on a from a continent that is only just now beginning to catch up with the rest of the world as far as tech is concerned. Great. Um, so uh, just to give some context to the audience and, and people who were here for the last Gaia, um, we had a big discussion on, on remote peering, uh, which is basically, you know, the idea of peering and IXPs has been that um, there is some central place where a number of local networks all interconnect uh, in an area. And uh, there's been, uh, as Emery mentioned, kind of a growth in this idea of uh, connecting at longer links. Uh, so basically you'll have a long haul link, sort of a least fiber or something like that, that can cross multiple countries, uh, long distances and create peering environments for networks that are not actually next to each other, um, but sort of from a, a network perspective, look that way. Here in the US, for example, we have uh, SICK here downtown Seattle and they're interconnected with uh, 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 MIX, the Minneapolis Internet Exchange. Um, and so the reality is, of course, that traffic goes over multiple ISPs on its path to Minneapolis. But from uh, the IXPs here perspective, um, it looks like just one hop. Um, and this is a growing phenomenon, especially in, in, uh, in, in Africa, 
uh, for this kind of um, uh, tromboning issues that we had mentioned uh, or that, that Theo mentioned earlier. Um, and so this is sort of a, a, a bigger issue that we're starting to see. There are connections from uh, uh, IXPs in Thailand, for example, all the way to Europe as a single hop. Um, and this can uh, confuse some elements of, of the network structure. Um, and so this is really a place for people to talk about the pros and cons of the space um, and why, why this is happening and, and what the sort of positives and negatives are. Um, so kind of, uh, I'll start with this. Does, does anyone want to add anything to this definition as I've given it? Yeah, we have a challenge with the definition of remote peering because some of our members also pointing like, you know, link between Prague and Vienna, which I mentioned before is one millisecond. And for some company, it's a uh, appointed like remote peering because it's a foreign country, but it's a one millisecond, which means in city of London, you have data center, which is much more farther than one millisecond. So I think the remote peering could be a little bit challenging for definition. Yeah, I think I agree. That's one thing that came out of the email discussion on this was uh, there was like the benefits of remote peering for smaller IXPs when they're remote peering with kind of each other in the sense um, that um, uh, there was a, a sort of a luminary in our space, Kanchana, who had mentioned there's a bunch of small ISPs in Thailand who are all sharing uh, one interconnect into an IXP. And that's considered remote peering as well because someone else is trafficking, you know, you're taking your traffic and handing it over. Um, but that's obviously very different than some of the really long haul links uh, that we're seeing elsewhere. Um, any, any other additions people would like to make? Uh, uh, if I may, I think it, it, it is very similar to what you just said, Curtis, uh, uh, because we, we should um, highlight the, the existence of resellers uh, in this market and a lot of peering goes for resellers. And I think if I'm not mistaken, the, if you're using a link for the reseller, it's, it is considered as a, peering, uh, as a remote peering link, even if you're within the same region. Um, maybe just a question from me, um, rather than sort of adding on to the definition. And I think it would be good if we could make a distinction between IP transit and remote peering, or um, maybe to explain what I mean further, um, you have providers of IP transit who will receive prefixes from their downstream clients and announce those prefixes most of the time at another exchange point or at various exchange points around the world, thereby providing the IP transit service. Um, how do we differentiate between the two? Um, and uh, yeah, I think it would be interesting if we could be able to just clarify that point. Yeah, I'll say from what I understand, um, you know, the distinction is that is really at the BGP layer, which is that with IP transit, the multiple hops in the network are included in the BGP message so that that number of steps is, is kind of made clear. Uh, whereas in uh, remote peering, that looks like a uh, basically like a one or two um, interconnect. Does, does that sound right, Brian? Um, yeah, technically, but is there a commercial difference? Um, because I think generally we in this part of the world are more familiar with IP transit and that's what we are sold on a daily basis. We have IP transit providers calling us all the time to offer a better deal. Um, but I have never been approached by anybody offering remote peering. Um, so that's, I think, the context within which I was coming. And I, I would like to sort of connect that to the comment that Amrish mentioned, where we talked about resellers. Um, and this is where I would probably see the confusion of the gray lines coming in, um, in that uh, an IP transit service may be, you know, uh, presented, if I may use that terminology as a remote peering, but is it really remote peering? Is there a commercial difference in the way it's happening out there in, in other parts of the world?
So I guess this sort of invites the question that I have, which is, um, uh, is there, like, what are the differences from business and technical perspective for, uh, between sort of traditional um, IP transit and these remote peering arrangements? And moreover, like, why would someone choose a remote peer over an IP transit connection? Um, uh, any ideas? Curtis, did you want people to respond? Yeah, yeah, this is for the panelists. Yeah, sorry, we just lost you partly there. Oh, sorry. Um, I see the bias jumping in. I'll repeat my question. Um, that IP transit has uh, sort of classically uh, done and remote peering provide very similar functionality. Why would an organization choose to remote peer instead of a traditional um, uh, IP transit arrangement? Oh, okay. I can try to go first. So um, usually, um, IXPs, um, especially the big ISPs, are, are quite appealing as a um, as an entity because they are they have so many different peers, and uh, usually uh, content networks are amongst uh, their peers, and and they might not all they might not you know uh, be peering with the local transit provider uh, in let's say an African country. Um, so it makes it very appealing for um for smaller isps um let's say in the african region to remotely peer with the bigger ixps out there because then they can easily have access to the big uh, group of uh other asns other peers and and mostly con content providers uh, in a uh as, as the goal to, to reduce the, the latency to, to connectivity, actually, to, to the end users. OK, we have a <clears throat> yeah, also. I'll, I'll, I'll also chip in on that um, and uh, sort of say that um, there are two dimensions, probably, that would be appealing, and especially if I talk about it from an African context, right? Um, one is cost. So if it will cost me less through a remote peering arrangement to be able to get better visibility on the internet, um, better diversity in terms of my prefix, um, let's call it uh, the whole routing management, right? Uh, then that's an advantage. But I think probably from a, um, a point of view of a ISP that is in a country like Malawi, which has very, very, very poor infrastructure and very little in the form of content delivery networks, the closest CDNs sit in Europe and in the Americas. So through remote peering, being able to thereby access, um, you know, a much wider range of, or even just even have primary access to CDNs to be able to thereby offer a better quality of service and optimize um, other more expensive routes. That is also definitely a appealing proposition. Yeah, uh, we have also a few members who are using remote peering, which is sense of just more than tens of milliseconds. And they typically are the gaming company who wants to have a coverage for some region. So, for example, then they develop some game for customers, but they want to expand to a certain region. So because of that, they deciding for building up remote peering to local IX, let's say in Thailand, to have a little bit more control than just buying IP transit. And just to add on lightly to this, when you say control, what do you mean? I mean, at a certain point, they have uh, some definition of latency. 
which is between Prague and uh, for, uh, remote destination. And it's typically fixed. And if somebody, uh, something happening on the link, it's uh, changing just in small percentage. But if it's IP, there could be few reroutes and the, the paths can be different in the time. And so there's just because it's a lease line, you get some SLAs that you don't get over. A yeah, IPP. yeah, yeah. All right, Tobias, do you want to jump in? Oops. Um, so uh, Tobias Hivich, um, doing stupid things and running an NAS uh, with also a lot of funny remote pairings. And one <laughs> of the things you see, for example, is that you have things like GPE, Global Peering Exchange by um, 174. And um, well, if you can just get any form of tunnel slash looking to you like it's actually layer two to a location where there is an IXP and you just can put a switch there, that is a sh whole lot cheaper than getting any GRT full, full table capable device like MX104, um, MX204, th those are really expensive in comparison to the switch you have to put there. And then you lump that back to where you have your routers anyway, and you basically get to the IXP. You get the same latency as you would have if you would put a router in the location where the IXP is and fraction of the cost. And like those switches also usually take a lot less power. So power is also something which is an MRC for you. So you basically get the same latency, a hop less, and um, the same being at the IXP. So it sounds like the, the general consensus here is that it is cheaper to do these remote peers rather than IP interconnect. Um, again, I would say classical. Um, is that an agreement with everyone? It feels weird to me in the sense that obviously you're using. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. Um, no, I think you were making a point. I'll let you finish, then I'll come in. I just wanted to add a disclaimer to my enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm sure I, I, I think my, my point is complete. I think like that cheapness is, is something that's, it, it, it's something that has always drawn me into this question because again, it's like the same physical infrastructure, but this like overlayness causes these changes. Um, and we'll get, I think, to a little bit of the problems with this from a networking perspective, from like a broad routing perspective. Um, but this has always been really intriguing to me that it is cheaper uh, and trying to understand why ha has been a goal. Uh, but Brian, uh, go, go ahead. Muted yourself. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I think for me, latency, um, that's the key word. Uh, and this, I would say, is a major concern or issue that would probably compromise to a certain extent, um, the participation of, especially networks or ISPs that sit uh, on continents like Africa or in countries like Malawi, which again have difficult um, infrastructure issues or are not connected to high speed pipes. Um, for example, right now, I just did a ping to 8.8.8. .8 .8. Um, I'm getting and I'm getting between 50 milliseconds to 132 milliseconds. I'm sure if any of you do a ping to 8.8.8 .8 .8 on your laptops or on your devices, you'll probably get below 10 milliseconds. Um, and that just is a very good reflection of, you know, to a, to a significant extent, how latency plays into some of these things. Uh, so I think the question then would be, you know, if we were to try and say we would like to encourage more remote peering for networks in places like Africa, we would need to find ways of being able to adjust some of the um, specifications or requirements around latency or find ways of optimizing the latency um, or cushioning uh, against that latency.
Yeah, I think so. If, if it's cheaper and faster, um, this sounds like a good thing. Um, and uh, obviously the, the ISPs um, that are a little bit more frontier will, will appreciate those benefits. Um, I'll say I, I want to lightly speak now to the sort of downsides, um, uh, which are somewhat religious in nature uh, at times. Um, but, you know, the, the highest level one, uh, as I've seen discussed, is this idea that um, by obfuscating the network paths away, um, it's much harder to figure out the latency. Uh, the way BTP works is that a hop count estimate and it does that by the number of networks, ASNs. Um, when those ASNs are hidden um, in the hearing, then it's much harder to guess uh, what route is the quickest way somewhere. Um, and so that's one problem that I've understood. And then at an even higher level, there's a feeling that um, some of these uh, peers are really causing centralization of the IXP infrastructure. Uh, which is to say a little bit to what Amrish was saying earlier of how um, this allows for kind of centralized places for CDNs. Everyone interconnects at Minneapolis here um, in the U.S. and the infrastructure goes in there. So the, the, you know, the IXP is incentivized to get as many eyeballs on their stuff as they can and to have as many peers as possible, um, even more than, you know, their physical infrastructure, uh, I should say physical network. Uh, uh, sort of layer one network underneath can can ostensibly handle so that it looks like they're basically the center of the internet. Right? Um, more remote peers just makes it look better for for the kind of metrics that they care about. Are these real problems? Um, is this um, you know me as a networking researcher being anxious about kind of silly stuff, uh, or um, uh, or is or, or is it just something that like you know centralization is was is a, a a repeated theme across a lot of infrastructure. Um, and as much as it's harder for networks like Brian's, um, it's uh, uh, sort of inevitable in, in just how, how things grow. So question to the panelists and, and the audience for that matter. Tobias, I thought your comment was wonderful. So can I? Yeah, I would like, uh, oh, go ahead. Is someone speaking? Okay, so no, I would like to to jump on the uh, uh, on the latency issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When you when you do remote peering, uh, you reduce the number of hops between the source and the destination, but it doesn't mean the latency is reduced uh, because uh, you have speed of light, of course, limitation of speed of light, and um, and the fact that the 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 IXP is hosted, let's say, on, a, on an other, another continent, definitely the speed would be much, uh, sorry, the latency would be much longer than if you had to access content from a local IXP or a local uh, internet service provider. So does it mean really that you will reduce your, your latency when, when doing remote peering? You definitely would reduce the number of hops uh, when trying to reach the, the other destination. Uh, but not necessarily the latency. Um, another thing I, I would like to to say is that, uh, uh, and you rightly pointed out, uh, Curtis, like uh, we do not see uh, all the AS hops in in the path necessarily where in in remote peering, and this causes complexity in when you have to debug your 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 network traffic, right? So if you don't know which hop it is using and, and where is the bottleneck, then uh, it is sometimes very difficult to troubleshoot. So it adds, I, I think it also adds complexity to traffic engineering, ultimately. Um, yeah, so I think I would probably say that, um, and you know, this comes up often when we are trying to discuss issues that um, are cross-cutting from a global perspective. Um, there tends to be first world problems and then there's third world problems. And often those are very different because of the context. So um, I would really only be speaking from a third world perspective. Um, and of course, yes, things like latency is an issue, but another big challenge is skills human capacity, right? 
This is a big problem in this part of the world. Uh, even today, without even connecting to an internet exchange point, you have ISPs, entire networks that are still running with static routes, lots of static routes in there, no IGP, um, no dynamic routing. And, you know, sometimes that is the biggest barrier between them even joining their local internet exchange point for peering because they don't know how, they don't have the skills. Um, they're given sort of do this, do this, do this. These are the requirements. You need your own AS number. You need your own block of IP addresses. Um, you need to have BGP and configure it so that it can be able to peer. You need to be able to put in your BGP filters and configure them in this and this and that way. Um, and, you know, they freeze. So uh, a barrier. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that there may be some barriers. Uh, while remote peering might offer a lot of advantages and may really be a great thing that can help, especially uh, networks like mine coming from our region, uh, there are some barriers that stand in the way of um, adoption. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Uh... I think one, one thing may be useful for the customers or members of IXPs is uh, marking remote peers. So that's meaning setting some sort of defined community for the peers who are from farther distances to make the life easier for the customers who are sensitive for the latency. So they can decide if they bring in them new value with the, that remote peer or they just can do quick reconfiguration and get rid of all remote peers. Tobias? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Tobias again. So, so I'd like to get actually to that point of getting rid of all the remote peers because um, as, as you said earlier, there's a question with whether it would, for example, for an ISP in Malawi not be better to be at a local IXP. The thing is, if the content happens to just be in Frankfurt, um, it, it actually might be better for them to um, just have a remote peering to D6 because then it's basically, you know, transit with extra steps, while the local ISP gives them other local users. What would help is if the local IXP would also have a local Google cache. And then latencies would actually get better. But that is something we probably have to keep poking people with like the Google things on their batch. Like you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, and then sometimes they will do it. Um, and apart from that, it's like, yeah, kind of transit with extra steps. Yeah, I mean, I think this really comes back to what Theo was saying as our kickoff talk here of uh, you know, why there's so much tromboning in, in Africa in particular in a lot of these frontier networks in that like a lot of the content is far away and towards what Brian is saying and, and you know, uh, there's a lot of incentives to uh, reduce your cost to those places uh, and reduce your latency to those places. So you set up these remote peers uh, to Frankfurt and the like um, and um, then that just sort of, uh, you know, resupports what's, uh, or I guess reinforces this, this uh, sort of model of, of the internet. Uh, it sounds like Tobias would like to uh, add on. Yeah, sorry, be because I actually uh, kind of remember what my um, first point was before you brought up the community, which was like Brian's point about um, we are lacking knowledge, which brings us to another kind of remote peering, which the network community really, really really despises, which is tunnel peering, mm. like, um, you know, all the kind of toaster and uh, washing machine IXPs, uh, mm. which are like remote tunnel only, or are like the low kicks, and, uh, you know, you have the Yolo Kodo rec and a couple of switches. But the thing is, that actually helps people to do things with BGP and do things with BGP in an environment where if they, you know, kind of break everything for the AS, well, they, they don't have IPv6 at home. It's like, that is bad, but you know, you don't have like other people that don't have IPv6 at home because of you. Um, and there I see this A role of remote peering because technically, especially if you have like not a dark fiber connection or a wave, um, it's, it's all over tunnels, right? It's just somebody else's tunnel and the NTU is a bit, little bit larger. But um, then you also have like this, this impact of this 
kind of dislike thing on actually building abilities and letting people run things. Reading Mallory's comments. Um, yeah, I, you know, Mallory's making the point that basically this seems like a self-reinforcing architecture uh, in this way that's kind of reinforcing how uh, hard it is to build networks in a lot of uh, less connected areas and just sort of going back to the metropole or a, a similar. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I guess that, like is this causative or is it sort of like, like, is this causing that centralization or is it a consequence of centralization and in terms of trying to potentially resolve this as a problem space? A question for the panel. Yeah, I believe the centralization is occurring because of the placement of content, right? So if content is centralized, to some extent, on only on European IXPs, uh, so there's a preference for for some content providers to place their caches um, in big uh, IXPs because of maybe competitive prices, and there is less of a market value to place them in smaller IXPs in Africa. Then this is where um, this is where the centralization is happening, and it kind of forces the hand of smaller ISPs. In that case, not to choose, not to go with their local IXP, but instead to go for local peering, sorry, for remote peering. Uh, and therefore, yeah, um, it doesn't contribute. This, the fact that remote peering is available to some extent is not, uh, is not contributing to the re reinforcement of the local peering fabric, I would say. I don't know if uh, Brian would agree with me on that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, to a significant extent, I would echo the same. Um, and uh, it, it's just that I do know for a fact that there are not that many uh, networks in our region that are even aware of the opportunities presented by remote peering. But that's a matter of time, I guess, right? Um, maybe the um the service providers the companies that offer remote peering as a service um have not i you know sort of focused on africa and african networks as you know uh you know good enough candidates for them to sort of uh market to pitch to and so on and so forth um so for the foreseeable future we, we do see, it, it, we, we, we are sort of stuck in this place where um, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. Um, I would say that we need to figure out a way of sort of striking a balance between boosting and promoting the local um, IXP and figuring out ways to improve the utility available. And it's great to see that some content providers have actually embraced this by offering edge options. So you have Cloudflare with their Pangea um, option that have a sort of scaled down version of their traditional CDN node that they can put into a frontier network or into a remote location. Um, just the other day, I had a very interesting discussion with Netflix regional head. And, you know, we are trying to get a new internet exchange point up in the long way the capital of Malawi, and they said, yeah, we're willing to help you guys get traffic into the exchange point by offering you. Um, you definitely don't meet our minimum requirements. So we'll treat this as a sort of development effort. We'll treat this as our contribution towards the growth of the internet by allowing um, a, a Netflix node to be in that uh, exchange point in order to add value and be more attract more local peers. So there are some content um, develop, uh, content uh, delivery networks that have that sort of awareness and energy, but there are others that sort of totally don't. Um, and yeah, 
Um, I guess that would be the, the only additional point to what Amrish mentioned that I'll put in. Mallory? Uh, Mallory Nodal, uh, CDT. So I don't want to be too reductive here, but I wanted to compare um, maybe policy possibilities that would be an improvement over some of the other trends we see. So in, in Europe, as well as in India and Brazil and places, we see an increase in um, policy that requires data localization. And I think it's for a similar purpose. Um, but actually, I think coming at this problem from where we are presents a potentially better solution, which is it's not about user data. It's about um, the, the hosting of services. Um, and so one of the problems, well, one of the opportunities actually is um, you have banks, you have government services, you have loads of other kinds of commerce happening on the continent in country and that's getting hosted abroad. Whereas the government, the government's government policy has a lot, has, has an opportunity to incentivize um, rather than penalize, like in the case of data localization, incentivize companies to host in country um, rather than abroad. So that's like, I don't know how well explored that is, but I do know it's, it, from my perspective, it would be highly preferable to something like data localization, which I think is economically protectionist and ultimately like has some pretty negative effects for internet architecture. Um, but this one I can see as being strengthening. So I don't know if it's worth looking into that. It really, if we're talking about a draft or a potential something that Gaia might do, keeping that sort of policy um, uh, maker in mind while drafting it could maybe helpfully be helpful and instructive um, in addition to helping the protocols and the standardization part of the IETF also weigh in and optimize um, this situation. Thanks. That is a really great thought. Thank you for that. Like, I'll add on to this. I think Tobias, if you want to come up, but uh, I'll, I'll add lightly to this thought, which is like, I think there's still this question of whether this is a good or bad thing at the end of the day. And whether Gaia or anyone wants to take such a strong stand to say, like, this is a problem to be fixed. Um, I think you see from Brian that there's like clear value in it to certain ISPs. Um, and like saying that this is just something to like choke out um, because it's bothering the Internet architecture is a strong stance. Uh, but I don't necessarily know that it's the wrong stance either. So maybe that's just continued discussion. But once we make that decision, I would love to attack this from policy side. I think it's really interesting of like you know, requiring peering with just neighboring countries uh, as an example of something that could be put together pretty easily. I, easily, I say, in terms of like, you know, thinking about it for five seconds at a panel. Um, Tobias. So um, I think it all boils down to what Brian said, which is capabilities. Because if you look at where stuff is hosted within Europe or within the US, well, the answer is usually EC2 or, well, Azure. Um, to a lesser degree, uh, Google tried some things, but well. And what you see within the US and Western Europe is that people lose, well, the ability to actually run stuff themselves. So in addition to that, we have like the strong push of large cloud companies to actually, well, run your stuff because they are like better at it, not necessarily cheaper. Well, maybe at first, but you will notice as soon as it's not anymore. Um, so, so like this whole marketing thingy, and this whole belief among policymakers that this is how it has to be, which has also been contributing to the erosion of capabilities. So now we have um, a region which is lacking, according to Brian, a lot of capabilities. And well, if we then have people there who have accomplished to get these capabilities, what would happen to them if we are already lacking capabilities here? And we have a higher GDP, we would just go over there and be like, hey, do you want to make four times the money in Germany? And then we again have less capabilities there. So we need more capable people and we need more capable people everywhere. And then we can talk about hosting locally because we're not getting that done within Europe as well. Five minutes left. Um, and uh, in that last, uh, Five minutes. Any any other sort of stuff from from the audience? Other stuff people want to add? 
Um, if not, I have my final question. Um, so in a way, like, I think there's an interesting tension here in that often these discussions are centered on um, things like frontier networks and how they're being kind of forced to do this remote peering through these architectural considerations. But at the same time, the reality is in the US, remote peering is a growing space. Um, and uh, the incentives are similarly pushing for, again, these interconnections across uh, wide disparate areas here. Um, is this just an inevitable centralization of the IXP infrastructure? Um, and it's not really about resources or is there something um, more fundamental at work here in terms of, or, I guess, you know, just repetition of earlier patterns in terms of like, you know, uh, sending things to uh, to Europe and, and the like, as, as Theo had mentioned. I don't think I asked that very clearly, but hopefully the panelists can interpret. Um, so my two Tambala, the Tambala is the Malawi currency equivalent of two cents of a cent. My two Tambala would be, um, I would see remote peering, especially for many countries in Africa as um, a bridge towards a better future. So I think that the whole world is growing. We are all growing together. And the networks that we have today and the networks as we know them are going to look totally different in 10 years' time. Um, we may not even be having this conversation uh, in another 10 years. So I would say that optimizations that work today may not be the same thing tomorrow because the rest, the continent is growing up, the continent is catching up. If you go to places like Nairobi, Johannesburg, um, Cairo, you will find pretty much the equivalent level of both presence in terms of content as well as latency in terms of connectivity as you'd find in Frankfurt, in you know, uh, Chicago. Uh, so as I would say the rest of the world in terms of networking is able to achieve a certain baseline. I think this is going to cease to be um, you know, an issue because it will just be all local peering or all peering will be local peering. Um, but there is now this optimization, if I may use that type of term to describe remote peering that provides a, 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 a solution and to, to a problem that you know, certain types of networks face. Not all networks, but certain types of networks. Um, there is no one size fits all for this. Yeah. Would I agree with uh, with Brian and that um, on the on the fact that um, it would be difficult for for developing countries to reach the level of I would say developed countries immediately or in the next couple of years. So the way to do that, the way to actually be able to reach content. Uh, in a decent way uh, with decent latency and everything is to to go with remote peering. Um, and uh, it goes along the line with the, the depth of transit, which is actually happening. And even if it's not the if it's not the case yet in Africa, it is going to happen as well. Um, and uh, we are also seeing more and more uh, IXPs trying to expand their footprint in other regions. Uh, so we are seeing that in Africa as well. And uh, this goes along the line with the remote peering, um, yeah, remote peering um, paradigm, I would say, paradigm shift. Um, you, would, you would see more remote peering, maybe at some point in time this will slow down because you would see more of these international IXP fabric in other regions and then more content being uh, displaced in those other region and better distributed. So I think it, it is a normal course of things that will happen. A big ramp up in remote peering in the next few years in, in, in Africa to catch up with the, where cont content is. And probably this will stabilize over time as more 
more and more IXs uh, develop in the region and more content is being placed in, in the region. Yeah, from different perspective of Europe, I, I think just enough to make signaling of, of the data, which is remote and local. And if we, everybody will be transparent, the more educated uh, engineers can handle that traffic with the uh, appreciate weight of, of traffic. So yeah, just keep it transparent. Great. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are at time. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists for making this work. I was really excited about this discussion. Um, and see you all uh, in a few months. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thanks to meet Echo, as usual, for your help. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. How are you? Congratulations. Do you have pictures of the baby? <laughs>